So 100 years ago, Einstein gave us a new picture of the world. He said, space and time are not what you think. Gravity is not what you think. And you know what? There should be little ripples of space and time that travel through the universe at the speed of light. He said this 100 years ago. This year, scientists announced that they'd actually discovered and measured these waves. So I want to tell you what it's about. Stepping back in time to see one of the first physicists who studied gravity, as you know, Galileo pointed his little telescope at the sky, measured uh, many things that had never been seen before, showed that there were mountains on the moon, satellites of Jupiter. He invented the pendulum clock so we could measure time more accurately. He even started to study gravity. He's very well known because he showed that if you drop a heavy object and a light object from the Tower of Pisa, they will both land on the ground at the same time. A demonstration that gravitational acceleration is independent of the weight of the object. He even started to think about relativity, uh, something that's uh, been puzzling to us for a long time. He said, if I have an experiment and I'm doing it in a ship, uh, and the ship is sailing along smoothly, I will not be able to tell that the ship is moving from inside the ship. So he, uh, he started in on this, and so was the beginning of modern gravitational physics. So uh, just a few decades later, Isaac Newton started to figure out what it all meant. Uh, he made a huge leap forward. He gave us his laws of motion. There were three of them. He invented calculus, which students now learn in high school. He gave us the law of gravitational force that says, uh, if I have two objects, I can calculate the gravitational pull between them. It's just a constant times the mass of the first object, the mass of the second object, divided by the square of the distance between them. This is enough with the, the uh, tools that he had to explain the orbits of the planets in the solar system, which had only just recently been figured out and shown that they were ellipses uh, by Johannes Kepler. So something else that he told us, which turns out not to be true, but which almost everyone believes anyway, there is something he called it was absolute space and time. He said everything that happens, happens against a background uh, where space and time are, are fixed. So he was wrong, and I have to show you why, even though we all believe it. So Maxwell, 200 years later, uh, combined the equations of electricity and magnetism that people measured in the laboratory with little coils and sparks and magnets and things, and he said, I now can calculate something that I never saw before and never knew before. I think light waves are little disturbances of electricity and magnetism traveling through space. He could calculate the right speed of motion for these light waves based on the things about magnets and things, coils in the laboratory. This was a huge, huge surprise for people. And I'm telling you this because it leads on to the next step. Now, this is the first time that we knew Electricity and magnetism could go through space within about 20 years. The first artificial radio waves were made by Heinrich Hertz, so suddenly we were able to prove electricity and magnetism could do this and that they would travel at the speed of light. So that was a wonderful surprise, but pretty soon people said, okay, well, if electricity and magnetism are going through space, what is it out there that's wiggling? What's enabling them to travel? Uh, because if you think about sound waves, well, we know that it's air that's vibrating and carrying the sound waves when I'm speaking to you. So with air, if I'm walking along, I can either catch up with the wave or go away from the wave, and I would calculate a different speed of motion of the, so of the sound waves according to whether I'm moving through air or not. So people assumed that we would find that with light waves as well. So uh, people started looking. So this man, uh, Michelson, uh, along with his friend Morley, uh, built an apparatus in 1887, this is now a long time ago, to find out whether the speed of light is the same to be, regardless of whether you're moving. So their little apparatus uh, was not very big, but it was big enough. And so uh, they measured to see does the speed of light change as the Earth goes around the sun, which it does pretty fast, about 0.01% uh, of the speed of light is enough to notice. They should have been able to measure something. There was no effect at all. So the speed of light is a constant, depend, undi, independent of whether you're moving along with the waves or not. Huge surprise, not like sound waves in air. Nobody could understand it. But 18 years later, this guy, Albert Einstein, uh, was a bright young fella. He was 26 years old. He had his first job. He was working for the Swiss Patent Office, and he was looking at patent applications all the time that were coming in about synchronizing clocks, synchronizing clocks for the train stations in Europe. And he said, well, okay, I can figure this out. I'll use light waves to synchronize the clocks in Europe, sending light pulses back and forth. 
Uh, and then he said, well, what if I try to calculate the synchronizing the clock in a train that's moving between two stations? Uh, and now if I believe what Mr. Michelson and Morley told us, the speed of light doesn't depend on whether I'm inside the train or not. So uh, how is this going to work? The answer that he found was completely shocking. Space and time are not absolute. Isaac Newton was wrong. So the way that we measure space and time is now going to depend on whether we're in the train moving or standing still on the surface of the Earth. This is what we now call relativity. So he gave us E equals mc squared. He said if you can possibly convert a little mass into energy, there would be a lot of energy coming out. Turns out this is what powers the sun, makes the sun glow, uh, powers nuclear reactors. So it obviously changed history because he told us that. Uh, he also told us uh, from this uh, simple calculation, simple to him, that uh, the maximum speed of motion of any particle would be the speed of light. You cannot go faster than light. 1905, people didn't believe it, but nevertheless it answered the question. So how are we going to find out more about this? Well, it turns out we've been testing his theory now for 111 years, and nobody has found the slightest mistake. So to tell you the truth, even though it's weird and surprising, it's got to be true. So think about believing impossible things. This is one. So 11 years later, he can, said, well, now I'd like to combine this story that I just worked out with gravity. So how am I going to do this? So he came out with a completely new idea, completely unexpected to most people. He said, uh, gravitation isn't a real force. Uh, unlike what Newton said, gravitation works by warping space-time. So uh, if space and time are warped, then what's going to happen? Light waves and particles like us, we're going to go through space following straight lines in a curved space. That's his story, and it's a totally astonishing story. Not only are space and time relative, uh, they're, they're warped. So it's, so far we've fa not found out a way to use warp drive yet, uh, but uh, anyway, this is the, where that idea comes from. So um, it's a beautiful theory. It's very simple. It's based on the fact that Galileo said every object falls at the same rate, whether it's heavy or light. So moving that along and combining it with his relativity theory, that's it. That's the thing that, uh, that astonishes us all today. So right away, he was able to prove that it matched something astronomers had discovered, a problem with Mercury's orbit. He explained that. He said, OK, well, if light waves go past the sun, they ought to get bent by the gravitational effect of the sun. So that was pretty soon tested, and that was true. He also said little ripples of gravity could travel through space at the speed of light. So gravity has a speed. Nobody knew before that gravity has a speed. Uh, and he even gave us, from the same time, uh, what we now use to describe the expanding universe. The Big Bang came from his equations. Who knew that uh, a patent clerk thinking about combining, uh, com uh, synchronizing the clocks in Europe and then working together with gravity would come up with these equations where the space is not what we think, time is not what we think, they're all curved, and it explains everything of our universe. How about that? So now I want to show you the people that started up a project to measure the waves. This is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And they built it, and these are the three people that started it. Rainer Weiss, my friend at MIT. Kip Thorne, a gravitational physicist at Caltech, the scientist behind the movie Gravity. And Ron Griever, who's uh, shown on the right, is now retired to Scotland. They started the team. It eventually grew to include 1,000 people and 14 countries. And in this country, they built two observatories, uh, one in Louisiana and one in Washington State. And uh, when, as soon as they got it working at what they were expecting to do, and they said it's working right, this is what they found. They heard and saw these little waves. I'm playing it over and over again, but it really only happened once. So this little burst of sound that you're hearing represents a gravitational event that happened a tremendous distance away, has traveled across the universe to get to us, and it, they happened to find it right away, almost right away, after they turned on their machine, which is a big surprise for astronomers. We didn't know the universe could do this. So this is what they say that they saw. They saw two black holes orbiting around a common center together, uh, faster and faster and faster and faster, and reduce and emitting a gravitational energy out into the universe, which has been traveling at the speed of light until it got to here, where we could measure it.
So a pretty shocking uh, confirmation of Einstein's theory and a new kind of astronomy. So what does it mean? A black hole is a place in, in the universe where there's so much gravity uh, that even light cannot escape from that object. Even time seems to flow into the black hole. So how big are these? Well, each of these black holes is about 30 times the mass of the sun. Imagine the whole sun, which is a million miles across, compressed down to um, 50 miles across. A whole amount of material to do that, it would, that would uh, be a black hole. So imagine two of them orbiting around each other, spiraling in, emitting gravitational energy that would travel across the universe to us. These objects that they found are extremely, extremely, extremely far away, 1.3 billion light years. That means the light has been traveling for 1.3 billion mile uh, years to get here, or if according to Einstein, gravitational waves would be traveling at that same speed. Uh, and so this is a, a really remarkable discovery. It's a huge technological achievement. Um, and uh, number one, of course, it means Einstein was right. So uh, that's an amazing theory that he gave us, that space and time are warped, uh, and that there's a speed of gravity is all confirmed. Uh, for astronomers, this is an, uh, a remarkable event as well, because we didn't know there was a way that nature had to make pairs of black holes like this that could find each other over the history of the universe and finally merge together. What is next for us in this subject? Uh, obviously, we want to keep on looking to see what else does the apparatus show us. Um, we're anticipating that there are neutron stars. Uh, neutron stars are like a giant atomic nucleus, but maybe 10 miles across with a mass a little bit bigger than the sun. Uh, white dwarf stars, uh, maybe the size of the Earth, also comparable to the mass of the sun. All of these things might fall into a black hole and emit gravitational waves, which you'd be able to detect. So we now have a new kind of observatory for astronomers to find out about the most amazing and exotic processes that might be happening way out there. So we don't really know how nature did this. We don't know exactly yet where any of these are. Uh, so the next thing to do is to build a telescope of some sort that can tell us where exactly did this event occur or did another event occur so we can follow it up, track it down, uh, learn more about the thing that made it. So to do this, obviously we need more observatories both on the ground and in space so we can pick up these waves. Very long term, we would definitely like to know about gravitational waves from the beginning of time, from the early universe. It is calculated and predicted that there should be vibrations of the early universe still traveling through space at the speed of light uh, that we might be able to measure. So astronomers are looking for them. We haven't found them yet, but you might hear about them in the next year or two or three. So if we could do this, we might be able to tell you what was the Big Bang material like? What would it make it start the expansion of the universe and make it possible for us to be here in Herndon having a conversation about all of this? Very, very long term, a great dream of scientists would be what are space and time really? Everybody wants to know and nobody can tell us. So when we get that answer, there'll be a few Nobel Prizes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>